Well, thank you all for being here. I'm so excited to get a chance to do this. I created this uh, presentation to work with some teachers who had been teaching for 20 and 30 years. And sometimes when you've been teaching a long time, you can get in a rut. Anybody ever feel like with what they do, they get in a rut? So um, we were trying to work on some ideas for creativity and being a member of the Learning in the Brain Society and going to workshops and conferences where people are talking about the newest neuroscience uh, findings and then they do it with educators there. The problem is they find out cool things and then the educators, it never gets across and gets implemented. So the goal is for us to kind of implement it into our lives. So hopefully I will talk about my job as a music teacher and all the wonderful little guys that I get to work with as musicians and maybe you'll learn something about yourself and how your brain works that you can apply to what you're doing so I hope it's I hope it's a helpful and interesting um, few minutes here so first fact I want to make sure you all know is that one of the only activities that activates stimulates and uses the entire brain is music so the entire brain is activated when we're doing a music activity. And that's pretty incredible. If you think about it, if you're doing a math problem, you can come up with that answer. You can think about it. And with rhythm, that beat's moving on, man. You're going to have to come up with the right note at the right time in order to make that piece happen. So because the whole brain is activated, including the emotional centers, it's a really deep learning experience. So music is the other non-additive, mood-altering, non-substance. Ask your doctor if music is right for you. I love these side effects. Common side effects include, but are not limited to, uncontrolled head bobbing, toe tapping, finger snapping, selective hearing impairment, and persistent melody flashbacks. I have a problem with the persistent melody flashbacks right about now with Felice Navidad. <laughs> right? <laughs> that one gets in my head. You're welcome. Now it'll be in your head all day, right? <laughs> All right, uh, Dr. Nina Kraus is a person who presents often at the Learning in the Brain conferences. So on a more serious note, um, up at Northwestern University, they have a place called Brain Volts Lab. And she said, music programs can literally remodel children's brains in a way that improves sound processing, which could lead to better learning and language skills. She does her work with adults. And one of the interesting things is, how many of you in here studied music when you were younger or are still studying music? Many, many. So actually, they could take a look at your brain waves and know that you had studied music without even asking you. They've got to that point. So we know that's true because we have a String Sprouts program that has 1,000 little kids that are three and four years old. And one of the fi findings that we found in the research is that their vocabulary improvement is very, very high in the, in, the violin pro, in the violin program. And cello now. This is one of our cello teachers here. And viola, and there will soon be basses. So all of these little guys that are doing this work before they get into kindergarten are going to have better academic outcomes. I mean, they've just got to, right? So that's exciting. So I'm going to pull back the curtain just a little bit. Um, about what we think about at the conservatory. So at the conservatory, we currently have 630 kids studying music on campus. We have 1,200 off-campus learners, which are the string sprouts, primarily pre-K age, kindergarten. And we have 200 enrolled in special programs, uh, uh, similar to, we have one up on the Winnebago Reservation. Uh, we have a guitar program at the Croc Center, things like that, a summer institute. So these 2,000 families are enrolled in programs that deal with these three components of intrinsic learning. Intrinsic learning meaning, I want the kids doing it because they just got to do music. And that's hard because that goes to motivation. You know, how many of you didn't like practicing? <laughs> right? All right. So as a teacher, our biggest problem is not, can I teach music to these kids? Our biggest problem is, can I get them motivated to practice? <laughs> so for us, it's more about how the brain works and how people learn and how to get intrinsic motivation happening. So every program we have is devised with these three 
components. Now, where did I get those? I got those from two researchers, Dietschy and Ryan, who that's all they do is research intrinsic motivation. And these are the three things that they found need to be present for someone to really want to do something intrinsically. Autonomy, they have to be able to do it by themselves. Competence, they need to be able to do it well. And they need to do it in a community that values it. So that's what we're about at the conservatory. Our mission statement is building musical community through education and performance to enrich lives. So education's a big part of it. Performing's the competence um, part of it. And there's 2,000 people in the community, and it's growing. So it's pretty exciting stuff. So a brain. So these are the things we are thinking about when we have a student walk through the door. There is something that we all have called the reticular activating system. I'll call it the RAS, so I don't have to say that any more times. <laughs> RAS. And everybody has a RAS. And what that does is it lets something into your brain so that you can possibly learn it. And I say possibly because it's a long route until you actually learn it. Uh, so to prove that you have this RAS happening, right now there's a lot of uh, millions of inputs going in to your brain or possibly get going in. For instance, the temperature in the room, the sound of my voice, the fan on that thing, uh, somebody moving, how the chair feels, all of these little pieces of information are trying to get in. So your RAS has to decide, what am I going to let in? So this is an example of your RAS, how your RAS works. We'll see if we all have one here. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wear and white pass the ball. Correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? <laughs> For people who haven't seen or heard about it, they like this before. About half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color for the player on the black team leaving the game? <laughs> Let's rewind and watch it again. <laughs> Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. All right, so how many people uh, did not see the gorilla? Mm -hmm. I was in a room of about, first time I saw that, I was in a room of about 400 people, and well over half didn't see the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, did you see the other things? No. See people, yeah, so that's your RAS in action. Your RAS is working because the thing that you wanted to focus on is what you're focusing on. So sometimes with a child that has trouble with focus, a buzzing bee is what they focus on, and that's their RAS is not helping them to sort out what it is that they need to hear or see. So the reticular activating system is similar to a fox that comes out of its den. There are only two things the reticular activating system cares about. The first thing is, am I in danger? And what am I curious about? So a fox comes out. Is there anything that's going to kill me? And then, huh, what's that smell? And it goes for it. So we're, the, we're similar in that sense. Now, most of us, I hopefully we feel safe here where we are. We don't feel like we're in danger. So the only way we can really engage is by being curious. If you've ever been bored in a class, you're sitting in a class when you were younger. Anybody ever get bored in class? <laughs> the way to re-engage yourself is to start asking questions internally about it. I wonder about this. I wonder about that. 
So we're trying to get kids to be curious about things in their lessons because that's how we know it's going to be, have a chance of getting learned. Now the amygdala is the emotional uh, center of your brain and music activates that. I'm glad I wasn't on that uh, guess the name of the song thing because I would have got the first one, but you know, if there was some Dvorak and stuff in there, I might have got it with the other ones. I was like, I hope they don't ask me to identify these pieces. <laughs> but there are all pieces that we kind of, you know, in our, are in our blood, songs maybe our parents sang to us when we were younger or whatever. Um, an example of this is we did a presentation for a woman who had Alzheimer's. And her entire family was there. She had four uh, grown children and the group played her favorite song that she had sung to the kids, which is You Are My Sunshine. And something about that song, during the moment we started it, she was there, she sang, she clapped, looked around at her kids, and when it was over, she was gone. So there's something about music that activates that emotional center of us, and if it doesn't do that, when we get activated, let me just say this, when the emotional content is there, it's much deeper learning, much deeper learning. So if we have a student that hates their piece, kind of hard, you know, when they don't like the piece, you want to get that connection in there because you want it to get here to the frontal lobe where they're finally going to learn something. All right, so it's been a long journey, right? So they get to the frontal lobe, then they can learn it. That's if they have a lot of connections. So connections and how we connect information is kind of where creativity comes from, I think. You know, this is my supposition. You have to have a, a kind of a wide base of information and you start connecting things in unusual ways and voila, you have really original ideas and creativity happening. All right, so we have one other thing, the spinning dancer, and hopefully this will happen. I'd like you to take a look at this and see if you see this dancer moving clockwise or counterclockwise. If you're seeing her going right clockwise, see if you can reverse it and get her to go counterclockwise. My right brain is in full gear today. I cannot switch her direction. So if you're seeing her going to the right, your right brain is more active. If you see her moving counterclockwise, your left brain is more active. Anybody, who's seeing her going to the right clockwise? Who's seeing her going counterclockwise? I oh, have a nice mix, right? <laughs> it's very important that we have a left and right brain. <laughs> okay. So. That the other thing about that we're dealing with in kids is every child will have a tendency to have be a kind of a right brain learner or a left brain learner. So we kind of need to learn that about them too. What's the best approach with the music to help them learn? Here's another uh, right brain, left brain that I think is kind of fun. If you can find the man's head within three seconds, then your right brain is more developed than normal people. If you can find the man's head within one minute, then your right brain is developing normally. And if it takes you longer than a minute, then your left brain is more developed than normal. So here it is. Has anybody found it? A couple people have it. Okay. So those are definitely right brain people that have found it. All right, I'll give you a couple more. If you still can't find it, then try looking in the lower part of the picture between the left side and the middle. If you still can't find it, then I suggest you make an appointment with your optometrist. Here it is. So if you can see it right here, right in there. Yep. So we've talked about the RAS, that curiosity, which gets questions that then you can learn. Once you have learn and you're combining that with other information, you know, you get ideas and that's where the creativity comes. So when we're working in a lesson, you know, we may have a student that really likes to do unit practice. It's very left brain and mechanical. They're going to need more of the right brain ideas. Like what picture would you 
what is this a snow scene or a beach scene for you? You know, those kinds of imagery for the more right brain side. Or if you have a right brain student that's just all about music, you're going to have to work on the discipline side of let's do a little bit of unit practice, those kinds of thinking. So learning to play music is the perfect tool because it activates the entire brain and boosts creativity. Creativity is about stealing good ideas, reworking them into new combinations. So getting a good idea requires exposure to stuff. And so usually when we get into a rut, it's because we're just teaching the same thing and we haven't really exposed ourselves to something new that would generate, oh, that would be really cool to use in the studio or whatever it is your profession is. So here's a couple of interesting uh, inventions that were created because these people were out experiencing things. So Eli Whitney realized his concept for the cotton gin when he saw a water wheel, a cat reaching through a fence trying to grab a chicken, his landlord scraping a frying pan with a thin metal spatula, or a horse-drawn sleigh. So he had to be out doing quite a bit of things to see all of those. A cat reaching through a fence trying to grab a chicken, was an inspiration for an amazing invention. Henry Ford conceived of a better way to mass produce cars after his visit to a graveyard, slaughterhouse, supermarket, the Grand Central train station, slaughterhouse. Crazy, right? Samuel Colt's inspiration for a famous six-shooter revolver was musical score for Amazing Grace, a ship's wheel, a table setting, watching a group of men play a game of dice was a ship's wheel. And a couple more. Rudolf Diesel got the idea for the design of his diesel engine from looking at a magnifying glass, a typewriter, a da Vinci drawing of the human lung, an Aztec spear. An Aztec spear. Wild, right? Last one. Dr. Rene Lenac was inspired to invent the stethoscope when he saw children sending signals to each other by tapping on a log, a woodpecker pecking on a tree, a picture of an Indian pressed against the ground listening for the hoofbeats, or the telegraph. Answer is children sending signals to each other by tapping on a log. So all of those uh, just kind of every day get out there and see new things. And, and I loved what they were saying about being around people. <laughs> Right? Not just on Facebook or texting or whatever it is we do and never say anything to a real person is great, right? Um, so these are a couple creativity exercises that I encourage teachers to do because if we're more creative, then our students will be more creative too because they will sense that and, and we often tell students to do these sorts of things as well. So the first, these are sort of two opposite ends of the, of the spectrum and you'll have to determine what, which one would be better for you. So some people need to get out and do things not related to their area of interest. So if I, all I do all day long is music, I need to find a hobby that's not music because that'll connect me with different types of people and different types of experiences. So I need to do that sort of thing. Maybe I just don't do anything. So maybe I need to go out to do some concerts, get some new ideas from other musicians, theater, art shows, all of those things are wonderful. Maybe I do too much. So that's the opposite end. You know, when was the last time you didn't have something scheduled? This is a real problem for students, a real problem for our students. Back in the 50s, they did an experiment where they were uh, testing maturity levels on five-year-olds and they did repeated the, the, that um, in our current time. Guess what? Five-year-olds in the 50s were more mature than our five-year-olds. Why? Our five-year-olds never have any free time. They're booked from sunup to sundown at every activity known to man. So um, having doing nothing can be an inspiration moment. You settle down, you stop, and bingo, an idea comes to you. So all good ideas for kids and for us. Second one is getting an idea gathering mechanism. Having something on your person to write down ideas. You know, I've had probably, I wish I was a millionaire, but I've probably had several million dollar ideas that I forgot, <laughs> right? You know, like, that would be cool, and then, oh, whoops, <laughs> you don't remember it. So I started, you know, I have something in my purse that I can write down, or if I think that, that would be a, a super idea, I need to explore that. And then I can revisit that and not forget. So, 
I think that's a, an important idea, all easy as it is. Stalking your heroes. So I have a couple heroes. One of my heroes is Pablo Casals, who was a famous cellist from the early 1900s. He was known for having a, the most beautiful sound and phrasing and all of those sorts of things. So um, I started reading all of his biographies and um, watching some old footage of him. And because if there's something about a person that you really aspire to have in your life, they had to work hard to get there too. And there might be some things you would learn from their path or journey that would really help you. Because why reinvent the wheel, right? There might be some really deep learning that you can get from those people. And there's something that, that you resonate with that person. So um, finding out who your heroes are, if you don't have one, you better get one. Because one of the things um, that we learned in uh, Talent Code, we had the author of Talent Code come to speak at the conservatory. And one of the things he said is, if you want to move forward, you always have to have somebody out there that you're looking to. because. You, that's, that's what helps us to move forward in our lives, is having a goal or having something we're attaining to. Uh, fourth one, do something every day and catalog it. A daily task, if it be truly done daily, is better than a spasmodic Hercules. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that quote. Um, and what this means to us as musicians is, um, or, a compose, or composing, is some people think, well, I have to have an idea. I can't. I can't go with a composition until I have my idea, or I can't um, write anything until I get you know, struck by lightning and I have this lovely idea. But really, doing something every single day, <coughs> systematically, more ideas come out of that, because you're kind of immersed in what it is. And so daily practice with the students is a thing. And yeah, scales are boring, but too bad. You're going to do your scales every single day, and out of that, grows, oh, what about my hand frame here? What about the way I'm holding my bow here? My tone could be, so there's all kinds of things that grow out of the boringness of something that you do every single day. All right, did I skip one? Nope. All right, so last one. This is my last thing today. This is a fun thing that we d can do in lessons to integrate your right and left brain. So if you discovered today that you are a more right brain person or a more left brain person, this little exercise here is a way to get both your left and right brain integrated for the rest of the day. All right, so the way this works is the letter on the bottom is right, left is the L, and T means together, both of your hands at the same time. So let's practice that. So we have right, left, and then on the top line, right, together, left. Okay. And so as we do this, we are going to say the alphabet as we do it, OK? All right, so here we go. Ready, go. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y. How'd you do? <laughs> okay. And you can tell from how much you struggled, how much you needed that, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was hard for me today. I'm really, I need it. Might, 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 be, might be the early hour. My brain integrates as we get closer to evening. Okay, so I have a special treat for you today. Um, I have Pauline and Christopher Lee, who are students at the, from the conservatory. And these are an example of, and their mom Swahi is here, and the accompanist Jiyoon um, also has two kids that went through my studio that are now at, Man one's at Manhattan School of Music, taking the world by storm as a violinist. You'll probably hear more about her, Jennifer, on in the future, because she will be a famous violinist. She's so amazing. Uh, so, her kids, one is studying to be a doctor, but also won all of the viola competition in the, in the area that he could win. So um, these are very musical families. And I really love the Lee family because she doesn't overschedule the kids in a million different things, but she takes every opportunity for the kids to be in a group class or a chamber music or go perform. 
with the frontier group or whatever the activity is that they can do with their instrument, those kids are always there. And you're going to see they have a very, they're very wonderful. So we're going to start with Christopher. Christopher, can we have you get your violin and come on up? Christopher is five. And Christopher, we have the String Sprouts program, which is for the pre-K. And then we have a program on campus called Growing Roots. And Christopher actually did Growing Roots on cello, right? And then his older sister played violin, and he said, I want to play violin. So he went to violin. And he's going to pay, play a piece called Handel Beret. And I think uh, Christopher's been studying for about 18 months. So this is the power of practice and hard work. Go ahead, Christopher. All right, and then our final performer is going to be Pauline Lee, his older sister. And Pauline's played for about three years and is a real superstar. She's in my uh, Frontier uh, Strings group, which is a touring ensemble that we've toured internationally and nationally, and um, just a wonderful player. She's going to play Fiddle Faddle by Leroy Anderson. Thank you. 
Sara. Pauline, I forgot to say, how old are you? How old are you? Nine. Nine, okay. Yeah, Paul, to, going back to the question thing, um, Pauline has a question quota when we're out on a performance because she asks so many questions, I'm like, you only get six. So <laughs> she's very curious. <laughs> and <laughs> that's why she learns. Otherwise, I go crazy. Um, in terms of brain development, music perform musical performance is every bit as important educationally as reading or writing by Oliver Sacks. I think that's an important way to end. It's such a big deal to getting involved with music in some way. Does anybody have any questions? Well, I asked earlier about the city bus program. Is yes. Is that something that is citywide, or do the people mm -hmm. have to just come to you? So uh, String Sprouts is what um, she's referring to. And String Sprouts is a program that was created for kids in underserved areas. And we have 1,000, we are the largest provider of 1 16th size violins or buyer of 1 16th size violins in the country. They were playing quarter size, I think. So they're really, really tiny instruments. And we provide those to the students um, that register for the program. And we give them 32 weeks of instruction throughout the year and parents have to attend, caregivers have to attend the classes. And what's really neat, it's very unique in the country, we're the, the biggest program of our kind in the country, and the research that's gonna come out of that we hope is gonna show amazing outcomes, academic outcomes, it's already showing some of those things. So we go to those neighborhoods. We have um, some programs after school in OPS, we have one out in Scotts Bluff, uh, that's my hometown, original hometown. Um, we have one in uh, Learning Community South. Help me out if I'm forgetting what uh, Croc Center has a program. Council Bluffs has programs now. And then we have some in-school programs, which are Nelson Mandela and Kennedy this year and Cody Elementary and Millard. So these are 1,000 thousand kids that would never have this opportunity. And we teach them for five years, provide the instrument for five years. And you may be like, why five? And that is because in around fourth grade, most schools start a program, and so they could get into the school program that way. Um, but, you know, we've wasted all of those years, three and four and five, when they're like sponges, that they could learn to play music. So um, that's going to be a huge, um, there's going to be so many string players in Omaha, it's going to be ridiculous, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, but it's also been a great thing for our community. We last year hired a full string quartet of musicians, professional musicians. Uh, Grazia Sagastumi from Honduras originally? Yes, Honduras. Ayumi Oishi from Japan. Um, let's see, who was our child? Molly Rizik um, came from uh, South Dakota or North Dakota, I think. And who was our other violinist? We had one. Tyler Roberts, Tyler Roberts, who was one of my former students, grew up, was in the Frontier Group, and then has now graduated and come back to offer his skills to the conservatory. So we have a very international group of teachers. Um, they're working together, and we're providing some really great jobs in the arts and for people from outside of our community. So who am I forgetting? Oh, yeah, I forgot to say. They don't pay anything for string sprouts. String Sprouts, it's amazing. Our community is so philanthropic for the arts. It's just, it, you know, it brings me to tears. So there have been incredible um, philanthropy and support of this program to help these kids have a better outcome in school and things. So we could do it without the Omaha community, which is a very, very amazing place to live. Would you not agree? Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I think a lot of times when people are older, if they haven't had musical experience when they mm -hmm. were young, we see, we see young kids doing things, and sometimes it's intimidating to think that we could maybe go back and start. Are there programs available mm -hmm. for adults? Yeah, actually, our student body at the conservatory is 10% adult learners. And these are people that are picking up instruments for the first time. Um, some are, have retired, and they thought, I want always want to do this. 
Others are, you know, they, they work all day at their job and they want something very interesting and new. And man, the connections you um, get from trying to figure out how to move a violin, uh, bow in left hand fingers and right hand bow and all of that is incredible for your brain. So it can really get your brain going and get new connections and myelin and all of that. So we encourage everybody to come and take lessons. Doesn't matter what your age is or if you've had any experience. One of the most lovely um, things is the adult recital. And I don't know if you saw the Omaha World Her Herald article that um, Betsy did with the singer who sang on our adult recital, but um, they're just incredible. All different levels, very advanced adults and just brand spanking new beginners. So it's a neat, a neat place to be. No fear. Come. Play whatever you want to play. <laughs> yes? Can we lock you in a room with the school board? When they enter kindergarten, we put a musical instrument Oh, it'd be so great. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get show that there's that there's so much value that that would become something that maybe kids across the country could do the string sprouts program in kindergarten through fourth grade or even pre-k. Um, at Kennedy they have a, a all-day pre-k which we're also working in. So wouldn't that be awesome if you know the results that we get over the five years show, gosh, it doesn't get better than this. So um, yeah, and we are very, very thankful for the connection we have with OPS. They have been so wonderful to us, uh, Dr. Evans and Renee Kerberg in allowing us to use the facilities after school for all of the Sprout programs and things. Um, it's just been really great. And they're gonna have to figure out what to do when hundreds of string players are now, have been studying for five years when they get to fourth grade. <laughs> but think about how wonderful that's gonna be for those guys. It's gonna be good. The, uh, the flow exercise that you did, mm -hmm. you see, do you, do you start, uh, do you do that on a regular basis with kids to kind of open them up before you? Yeah, there's other things. Um, I went to, that was from, I got that from an educational physiology class that I took in Cal when I was in California. And we, there's a lot of things like, you know, the cross crawl stuff you can do that integrates left and right brain. Um, actually, I had one kid when I first started teaching who had a lot of problems with left and right brain integration. And one of the things they told him, you need to do two things, play violin because it crosses the midline and baseball because it crosses the midline. So those are good, acti anything that kind of crosses the midline will help you to integrate left and right brain. But definitely if you see lack of coordination between hands and stuff, those kind of activities are really good. There's also easy things like you should always drink water before your lesson because <laughs> electrical connections are, need water. So just being hydrated and things like that, like the small, there are small things that can help kids to have better left-right brain integration. If, if a child doesn't have that, they, a lot of times they've skipped the crawl stage, like they didn't crawl when they were a child. This, that's what happened with this particular kid. So they made him crawl. They made him do the activity of crawling, which is left and right, left hand and right. And when he tried to do it at the beginning, they do it like this, because they they're not doing it back and forth. So. I guess it's very important. Make sure all of your children crawl. <laughs> Any other questions? What's your instrument? I'm a violinist first. And then when I was working on my doctorate and things, I did viola. And then all of the groups that I played in professionally recordings, I'm playing viola. But mainly my instrument is violin. Yes. I haven't. Okay. What do they do? They flip the handlebars to where if you steer right, it goes left. And oh my lord. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sounds like a recipe for quick, <laughs> quick ending of your life. <laughs> oh wow. 
redo that then and consciously switch? Whoa. Yeah, I haven't seen that. I'll have to check that out. I, somebody, I was in a conversation with somebody this week, I can't remember who it was, where they were talking about if somebody loses an appendage, they can have you, like, through a mirrored system, you look at your other hand and imagine it as the other, and it feels like it really is your hand there. Like if you're feeling pain, phantom pain in your left hand, and it's not there, they can make you feel like your right hand is your left hand, and then it fixes it. So I know left and right brain can... Your, the brain is an amazing thing. It can do all sorts of things. If you're blind, that part of your, of your brain can do another function even, they found, and stuff like that. So it's pretty interesting. Any other questions? These are awesome. I hope that was interesting or entertaining or fun. So thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being able to do this. And